one of the most naive thoughts going into a divorce or family courts or anything, and we hear this all the time, and I thought the same thing. If you tell the truth, and, and if you, of course they're going to say, this is ridiculous what you're doing to the other person. The truth doesn't make a difference. Unfortunately, and, I, and I'm not saying that, that um, I'm not saying to lie. I'm just saying that the truth does not make a difference in some of these issues. And so the person, and this is when I talk about the divorce rape culture, the person who's saying, listen, I'm trying to keep the marriage together. I'm trying to, I don't believe that this marriage should even be broken. And the other person is lawyering up, filing this, filing that, racking up bills for you. And because you're not responding back with the same type of force, um, you're getting basically going through the divorce rape. And the attorneys will encourage this because how do attorneys, attorneys make money? Conflict, prolonged conflict. In fact, this is what the attorneys will tell you. Well, you know, we want no fault divorce because it's gonna keep your bills down. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it never ends yeah. because after a divorce, the attorneys know where the real money comes into the modifications. Call me back, yeah. call me back. Well, my wife's attorney at the last hearing actually had filed for the court to to give to pay for me to pay her lawyer fees for yeah. bringing before the court um, you know the motion for summary judgment that they felt was you know was inappropriate. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, because, because, yeah, and here's the thing: is if you expose their racket, mm -hmm. if you expose their racket, their business will dry up. Mm -hmm. They really these some of these attorneys should be disbarred because of illegal practices and what they're doing. Yeah, well, really, if, if the attorneys were not simply promoting and the judges making ministerial yeah. decisions and, and administrative actions, uh, and they did away with the, with the unconstitutional unilateral no-fault divorce, mm -hmm. they could actually do what the, what the judges and the lawyers should be doing mm -hmm. and, and really looking at the fault-based Mm -hmm. Divorces, mm -hmm. you know, if there is truly a fault that they need to, do, you know, have a judicial uh, hearing. Yeah. You know, Should, that's what that's where the lawyers should be focusing, not yeah. on these administrative, you know, unilateral no fault divorces. Yeah. You know, really, there's no when a defendant has a day in court, it's just a charade. Because it is a charade. One hundred percent of the time, it will always be cited in the plaintiff, but yet. Did the judge or did the lawyers tell you that going in? No, they no, never they, tell you that. They, 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 they have all the to. Money. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because the first thing you do is you fill out your balance sheet. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, so they have three hundred thousand dollars, and and there was an unwritten rule that I heard about in California that they would look at forty percent. We can take forty percent, and they're not. It's going to hurt them, but they're not going to come back and like try to shoot us or something like that. So. $300,000 here, we have about 120000 to work with. And the whole, the, the attorney system, they're buddies. You know, one attorney and this attorney that are fighting each other in court and stuff like that or whatever they're doing. Golfing we'll go, on the weekend. We'll go golfing <laughs> on the weekend and may have the judge go with them. It's incredible the amount of collusion that takes place. I talked with this one lady that I, that I used to work with who was a paralegal and she said, Jeff, I worked for an attorney and he used to say, I love it when pretty young women come into this office with pocketbooks and, and, and knew that this could be right check after check after check after check. And uh, that's exactly what was going on there. Um, At the Divorce Master's hearing, uh, one, of the, one of the issues with challenging the subject matter jurisdiction of the court and the constitutionality of the, of the legislation is that, that there's no lawyer that will represent you in that right. because you're, yeah. because you're, you know, you're taking yeah. away from the lawyer. Exactly, um, exactly. So and, 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 he, and that was actually at the divorce master's conference that was pointed out by, by my wife's attorney that, well, he's never going to get anybody to represent him. And the master said, well, you know, maybe there's somebody that wants, you know, a researcher or something like that. You know, we don't because know. Because the attorneys will recognize not, it. Will not cut their own throats. Yeah, they yeah. recognize it. That that's, so, so that's where I've had to do this whole process pro se. Yeah. Because... There's not an attorney, even though 
you know, what, what I'm challenging in the law is, you know, it's 100% accurate. Yeah. It's, yeah. they're not willing, you know, a, a, an, an attorney's not willing to go against their own job. Yeah. So what you just said as well, there, I have a friend who had to pay um, a couple hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. because his wife had never worked. And the way that the Texas Family Code is written, and again, I don't know about Pennsylvania, but the judge has the ability, the discretion to award, um, if, if this person who's filing for divorce does not have the money to pay, mm -hmm. the attorneys must be paid. So the judge can make him pay for her or her pay for him. Mm -hmm. The lady that I talked with last night that I was telling you about earlier, um, when she, her ex-husband files for divorce, does all of these things, um, and, is having an affair with this woman, everything else, and then goes, gets a divorce, and the judge says to her, you pay him a million dollars. A million dollars. So criminal activity, it used to be that adultery was considered, um, in some places, a felony. In fact, in fact, in some places, it still is punishable, but nobody really does that. In the military, adultery um, can get you court-martialed. Even if we had the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, as the standard for our society, we could start to deal with some of these things. Now, granted, the same thing in the military, a lot of adultery is not punished, but the provision is there for it to be punished. In many states, uh, they still have some states that have it. Um, I believe in some states, I think the, the, the biggest punishment I heard would be up to five years in prison, but I'm not positive about that. But is adultery a crime? It absolutely is a crime. When you are destroying children, when you're destroying a family, when as a result of this, that you will have taxpayers now having to subsidize a divorce in the form of whether it be food stamps or Section 8 housing or, what, or other welfare pro programs, or if the children turn out delinquent and cause crimes, you have the juvenile justice system, you have other criminals. Society is subsidizing this divorce. Ad adultery is a crime. So much so that in some countries, now I'm not saying that we should go there, but you have some countries where adultery will get you stoned to death. That's how serious this thing is. And the way you look the at Testament it... The Testament Bible says that that's the way that it should be. <laughs> I know. It was not have free sex with everybody and, you know, you could hook up with her and him and whatever it may be. Um, it was considered a very serious crime. And this is a problem that we have in America. We no longer look at adultery as being a crime. Adultery is glorified. Adultery is, usually it's the person who's having it committed against them is have jokes made about them, about him or her not knowing what's going on. Adultery is a crime. It is destroying children. It's destroying families. It's causing increased um, societal um, subsidies to be paid in the form of taxes. Why are we letting adultery get away, go away scot-free. In instances where you sometimes have pastors who commit, and I'm gonna talk about the church for a moment, pastors who commit adultery and then they still keep their pulpit. That is incompatible with anything within Christianity. And, you know, what I would say, you know, these political candidates, they're being caught having affairs. It's not, it's not just that they're having affairs, but they, in many instances, are committing, committing adultery. You have a, you have a, a, a bond here and when you look at children of that union, 50% mother, 50% father, what whoever is having the adulterous relationship is saying, I am tearing a part of that 50% of that child. It should be, adultery should actually be punished as a crime. That is my opinion. Um, I know that people are gonna be mad at me for saying that, but I think we need to take a look at adultery and punishing it and not rewarding it with no-fault divorce. Because no-fault divorce, what often happens is that the person who commits adultery files for no-fault divorce. So not only has committed one crime, but also files for divorce and gets half of everything, often gets the kids, often gets this, it's, it gets rewarded. Well, I, don't, I, I haven't looked into it too much yet, but the, my wife's attorney that represented her at the, at the last hearing mm -hmm. actually said that it's the Pennsylvania state law that that if there is a fault-based divorce, they must file under no fault first. So I don't know that that's, you know, I don't know the details of that, but, mm -hmm. but according to, to the attorney in the, in the hearing, mm -hmm. so they're, they're forcing them to file right. under no fault. 
Yeah, and that's, and that's why, why Matthew Johnson got involved with this, because of what happened with his own mother and father. And it was so unjust that he thought he, he was going to start to change the law. And the same thing that, you know, there's, a, there's some of us that said this whole system is so wretched. Um, we have got to make everything fault-free, but they're destroying our families. The destroying our children. I, did, I was not aware of that as far as in Pennsylvania that you have to file for no fault even though there's fault. Mm -hmm. it, does the same thing occur if, if, say if I'm beating my wife, do I have to file for no fault first? Uh, according to this attorney, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. you know, it seems to me that if we, we, we don't eliminate want, we don't, the unilateral no fault, yeah. you know, then we would be, then we yeah. could actually have a judicial hearing and, yeah. and be able to to actually, you know, to have due process, both the defendant and the plaintiff need to have equal opportunity to to, to uh, justify their case. Right. And and certainly that in the unilateral no fault divorce is not the case. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's being decided one hundred percent of the time in favor of the plaintiff. Yeah.